Thank you. All right, welcome back to Court TV Live. Of course, I'm Michael Ayala as part of an attempt on behalf of Court TV to help shed light on cold cases across America and maybe help to solve them. We want to turn our attention now to an unsolved case out of San Diego, California. 14-year-old Clarissa Castro disappeared after a party in San Diego in 1991, more than 30 years ago. Now, her body was later found in the San Diego Bay about a few months later. Castro's death barely made headlines 33 years ago, but now a popular podcast is trying to change that using a deck of playing cards. Script News San Diego has more on the story. She was my sister. Um, we did everything together. Um, we talked to each other. We protected each other. Um, that's all we had was each other growing up. That's how Celestina Ramirez remembers her little sister, Clarissa Castro, and the bond they shared. A protective older sister who says she just couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong the day Clarissa disappeared. I don't know what came over me. Um, um, I just started having these feelings where I was drawn to her to figure, you know, I, I just couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what was going on. It was October 13th, 1991. According to Celestina, 14-year-old Clarissa was having a party at the Lamita home she lived in with her mother and younger siblings. At the time, Celestina lived elsewhere, but still saw her family often. I was the oldest and I wanted to protect her in any way possible. Celestina says the party eventually broke up, and the last time she went to the house, everything was quiet. She and Clarissa talked outside briefly, the last time they would ever speak. She went back inside and made sure that she went back inside. And that was it. That was the last time I seen her. And the next morning, that's when my mom came to the house and asked me where did I hide her, where did I put her. Clarissa was never seen alive again, and it would be years before the family would get any kind of answers about what happened to her. This 14-year-old's walking along a pathway and comes across what he believes is maybe a body. It scares him. I mean, he doesn't even get that close because he sees what looks like maybe decayed legs, uh, something wrapped in some sort of tarp, but uh, against a, what's a, like a chain link fence at the time. Chula Vista Police Sergeant Anthony Molina. The way that her body was found, it w there was no doubt for the investigators. In fact, the homicide team was called out right away. There was no question they needed to be called out. But the level of decomposition presented a major challenge. This actually required the work of a forensic anthropologist, and that happens sometimes when bodies are badly decomposed or, or pieces need to be put back together. So those type of cases tend to have a lot more question marks around them. Molina says investigators still don't know exactly how Carisia died. Her body went unidentified until 1994, when the Department of Justice performed an audit on missing persons cases from the San Diego County Sheriff's Department, the agency that took Clarissa's missing persons report. It was then that sheriff's investigators and those with Chula Vista PD started to connect the dots. When that happened, that was the opportunity for detectives to share information and say, okay, let's actually compare dental records. When they did that, they realized it the missing person was the person we had. The news was a shock to Celestina, who clung to hope her sister was still out there somewhere. I still couldn't believe it, and... And I kind of... I kind of, kind of, you know, I guess, blame myself because I had that feeling. I just didn't know what it was. Identifying Caricia was just the beginning of an investigation that would turn up few answers. The case quickly going cold. Over the last few years, investigators across the country have been playing a game of risk. But after all these years, there's new attention on Caricia's story. Each week, our team of journalists will be reporting on a case that's gone cold and telling you the details only police or family members know. The Audio Chuck podcast, The Deck, featured her case on a recent episode. I'm Ashley Flowers, and this is The Deck. We were all kind of shocked that such a, a young, vulnerable person didn't have the kind of reporting that we, we hope to see. 
The deck refers to special playing card decks that have pictures and information about the victims in unsolved cases on each card. They're handed out in jails and prisons in states all over the country in hopes someone inside might know something that leads to a break. Caricia is the queen of diamonds for San Diego County. The deck host Ashley Flowers says the idea behind the podcast was to breathe new life into cases like these, giving them a national platform. But we've kind of made it a priority that we're trying to hit every single state that has a deck, every single state that's willing to work with us. As for the lack of attention that Caricia's case received back in the 90s, her sister believes it may have been because Caricia did have ties to local gangs, but says that was the reality for many of the young people living in her neighborhood at the time. Melina says regardless of the circumstances, the commitment is still there. I can tell you from my experience, especially with our detectives that work all of our cases here today, we see a 14-year-old girl and we see a family that's hurting, that needs answers, needs justice. She was only 14 years old. She was a little girl. If this was one of your loved ones, would you stand back and do nothing? Hoping that did we get some kind of answer um, or more than what we know right now? Lindsay Pena, ABC 10 News. Folks, if you or anyone you know has any information at all regarding Clarissa Castro's death, please call the number to San Diego Crime Stoppers that you see on your screen right now. And, you know, any help would be uh, greatly appreciated. All right, let's bring back in our guest still with us to discuss, criminal defense attorney, former prosecutor Franz Borghardt, and former law enforcement officer Claudia King. Claudia, you also have a podcast called Strong Enough where you bring light to people who have survived or done things and gotten through things, uh, wonderful stuff. So you, as well as anyone, knows the strength and power of podcasts. Talk about that aspect of the case and how important they are in keeping these types of stories alive. They are so important and beginning, I think, with Serial, um, that was kind of the start of true crime podcasts and the world being able to hear a story that they wouldn't have otherwise heard. I think it is fantastic that so many true crime podcasts are out there and are focusing on cold cases because it does give somebody the opportunity to hear that story that may never have heard it and may have a piece of information that would be a piece of the puzzle. So. I'm really happy to see that happening. I'm happy they decided to feature this case and hopefully additional true crime podcasts will focus on this case so it can broaden the audience and get the case out to more people who might be able to contribute to get some answers for Clarissa's family. Yeah, no doubt about it. And Franz, you know, uh, there was talked about a little bit in the story there that this case didn't really get the coverage um, that some other cases get. Now, the media has limited resources, can't cover every case, but this is a perfect example of a case that might not be covered, partly because of where they lived, who they are, uh, who the victim was, and the fact that you heard this as well, there may have been some connection to gangs, but again, in certain communities, a connection to a gang, that's kind of just being young. Um, your thoughts on that aspect? So in 2024, we're in a world of click and listen. And that is the benefit of these true crime podcasts. This is why I love them. This is why I'm glad that Court TV is showing uh, and airing this, this case is because the ability to disseminate information to the public, to that very public that may have just one little kernel of information or evidence that can lead to someone. And ultimately what you need is you need something that can tie preferably with physical evidence, and this is a tricky one with, with, with the decomposition issue, but you just need to keep talking about it. And in 2024, we can do that in a way that we couldn't do in the same way and manner at the time of this crime. So um, I, I agree that, that, you know, look, gang affiliation or gang links may not be enough, but every time somebody sees this, it's an opportunity to solve the case. And I got to tell you, Claudia, when I saw that deck of cards, I thought it was the most ingenious thing. But to even, even more so that they're handing these cards out in jails and prisons. That is a font of information that I hadn't even thought of. I mean, I was thinking, okay, maybe you take it around to neighborhoods. 
But jails and prisons, I, I mean, it's just ingenious, first of all, the concept of this deck of cards, and then handing it out in jails and prisons. Such a fantastic idea. I wish they would also hand them out to the public uh, for another source of information. But yeah, there are so many people who are in jail and might have, again, that one piece of information, that one kernel, like Franz talked about. And the fact that they're handing them out in the area related to the crime is even smarter because as far as the people in prison and jail, those are the people who might have the answers, the ones who are local to where the crime occurred in the first place. Yeah, and I think this case also highlights the need for national attention. This case, you know, they, they found this body. They couldn't identify it. It wasn't until the Justice Department performed an audit on, the, on this uh, San Diego County Sheriff's Department that they were able to sort of connect the dots, and they were finally able to identify her, Franz. So the importance, again, highlighted of this national intervention and the need for national databases. I, I think national databases, national intervention is where we're moving towards, Michael. And it's going to be one solved case at a time. Um, you know, and look, if it's playing cards in a prison that gets it done, awesome. If it's, you know, if it's, if it's somebody just seeing something or listening to a podcast or anything, you know, it's just that kernel of opportunity. And, and hopefully with each case that we solve, it will get the, the nation to figure out and realize, hey, we need to work together and not, you know, not harder, but smarter. Yeah, one case at a time, one case at a time.